Okay, so you should have watched the introduction video already. The first group of people, well the first two groups of people from the uh, early medieval European uh, history of art and architecture that we're going to look at are the Merovingians and the Anglo-Saxons. Uh, who kind of become the Vikings. There's a lot of people that sort of intermix and stuff and become the Vikings. But anyway, all right, let's look at some stuff. We don't know the full scope of art and architecture from this period um, because a lot of stuff was made out of wood and didn't survive. So what has survived is mostly weapons, personal adornment, like pendants and belt buckles and purses and bracelets and jewelry. Um, and those kind of things are all found in burials. Um, they, we do know just from the work that we have seen that they, as a group, rejected the idea that naturalistic realism should be a goal of art. So things become much more stylized, much more abstract. Not super different from what we see happening in the Byzantine, also more abstract and stylized, but this goes even further. And there's less interest in um, some of the ways um, humans are represented, that humans kind of aren't as much of an interest at all. Um, we see lots of abstract ornamentation. That's a big thing. Um, and these bejeweled kinds of personal objects are status symbols. OK, so let's look at some examples. So these are um, uh, fibulae, excuse me, that were found in a uh, burial. So there are things called tumulus, a tumulus, uh, which is one of your vocabulary words. I'm actually making a note because I think I need to add that to your vocabulary words. Um, that's a burial mound. So you can see that word in your vocabulary list for this section. Basically, um, in this culture, people were cremated, and then the ashes were put in the mound with their various personal treasures. Um, we know this from the seventh century writing Beowulf, which is an Anglo-Saxon epic, okay? So let's look at these fibulae. So fibulae is the plural of fibula, and when you hear fibula, you maybe think, like the bone in my leg. You're not wrong, but this is a different meaning of that word. It is a clasp or a brooch. Specifically, it was used um, to hold clothing together. So this is, we're, we're pre-buttons and things here. So, so these kind of um, adornments were used to hold things together. They're kind of like a super fancy um, safety pin, basically, okay? Uh, so this is a pair of Merovingian looped fibulae. They were found in France in the mid 6th century. Um, they have silver gilt work and filigree with inlays of garnets and other stones. Definitely status symbols to have something this um, jewel encrusted. Um, so this would have been for an elite patron of the arts. Um, zoomorphic animal forms and design become popular in this time period in this culture. Can you see animals in these fibulae at all? I'll let you look at them for a second. All right, if you look at the very top, we have an eagle head on each of them with the, the garnet being the eye. If you look like coming down the fibulae, there's a fish. So we have a couple of animals there. We have some more um, bird heads around the bottom kind of interlinking. This is the Sutton Hu ship burial, which I want to show you because this is where we find a lot of the artifacts that do exist from this time period is in these kind of burials. So um, one of the things, we know that there's a king named Merovec. Um, so he's who the Merovians um, are named for. And he's the king who ruled most of what is now France. So the Merovians and the um, Anglo-Saxons um, ruled a lot of Northern Europe and we find most of the artifacts related to them in burials. This is the Sutton Hoo ship burial. It's probably the most famous archeological discovery related to these groups of people. In 1939, it is found in Suffolk, England. And um, there's basically archeologists uncover this ship, this whole big boat, this big ship, 
that was uh, buried in a mound at Sutton Hoo, which is very near the sea. Um, it was a full ship. It was never set out to sea. They could look at it and find that it, it had never been in the ocean, so it was created for a ceremonial purpose. And inside it, they find many, many treasures. So let's look at some of the treasures that are found. They find a purse top with Chloe's and A, they find gold, they find glass, they find garnets. There are 40 gold coins, which we know from Beowulf is most likely to pay the 40 oarsmen to cross uh, the Sea of the Dead. Um, there are silver bowls. There's a silver tray with royal Byzantine seal of Anastasius I, so it was probably stolen from him um, in when they, they sacked a Byzantine stronghold. Um, there's a belt buckle. There's two silver spoons uh, with Salus and Paulus, uh, which alludes to the uh, Christian conversion of Saul to Paul, which is a biblical story. Um, so there's lots of, of cool treasures in here. Here's one of the most uh, kind of incredible treasures. So the rest of the purse has disintegrated. It was probably made out of leather, uh, but the cloisonne top of the purse still exists. And cloisonne is one of those words that's a vocabulary word for you, so you should make sure that you know that one, because uh, it's the kind of thing that I'll ask you on a test or quiz. So this is seven and a half inches wide. Um, it's made out of gold, and then it has this cloisonne technique. So we have four symmetrically arranged groups of figures here. Um, in the sagas of the time, heroes conquered monsters. So there's battles between men and beasts, which is at least partially what's happening um, in these two outer symmetrical figures. We have beasts attacking a man on each side. And then in the center, those two groups are um, eagles attacking ducks, which were probably symbolic of different groups of people. Uh, the thought is that this might be the burial of an East Anglican king named Raidwald, who ruled from 599 to 625, because he was baptized before his, his death, so he actually became Christian. So some of the kind of Christian-related artifacts in the burial might make sense um, because of that. Uh, Anastasius I was emperor from 491 to 518. So if the tray was stolen, stolen during battle or obtained during trade, um, it actually may not be this guy that they thought it was for a long time because the dates don't really match. So his, his identity is not totally certain. Um, looking back at this purse, so we've identified some of these zoomorphic, these sort of animal forms, which sometimes the zoomorphic designs are so integrated in the interlaced patterns and so abstract that you don't even see them at first. Um, also, we can identify some abstract interlaced designs. Some have writhing animals within the design, and some are just abstract kind of line work. This is a big theme in the early medieval European world. Um, you'll notice it in manuscripts as well when we look at some illuminated manuscripts from this time. Um, ship burials in general, we have Vikings, Anglo-Saxons, um, a lot of groups of people from this time are buried with their ships. Sometimes they're buried in these mounds. Sometimes they're set adrift in the ocean. Sometimes they're burned. And sometimes it's a combination of those things. Uh, Sutton Who was a big one where this was found. Osberg, Norway in 1904 was a big one. It's on the west coast of um, the Oslo Fjord in Norway. And in that one, there were two women, 14 horses, three dogs, and an ox four carved posts with animal heads. It was a 30 rower ship, 28 foot tall mast. It may have been the pleasure yacht of um, a woman of high status is kind of the going theory. All along the border are interlaced animals. Um, and there's a, a sea serpent stylized as the head of the ship. Um, okay. Who were the Vikings? So Vikings have um, been a figure that's been popular in um, contemporary pop culture for quite a while. Um, the first thing I think of is Eric from True Blood. I don't know if there's any True Blood fans out there, but he's, his backstory, he's a vampire, and his backstory is that he was a Viking. Um, there's also that show that I think is just called Vikings. <laughs> That's kind of popular. Uh, the Northmen came out sort of recently. So there's, there's a lot of fascination with Vikings. Um, in 793, the Vikings land in the British Isles. 
These are, um, Vikings basically are pre-Christian traders and pirates. So they're seagoing people. They come from Scandinavia and they're called Vikings because of the Vix, uh, V-I-K-S, which are the coves and harbors off the Norwegian shoreline where they would uh, park their boats, park their ships, basically. Um, so they land in the British Isles in 793. This isn't great news for the monks living in the British Isles at this time. Um, they destroy the monastery at Lindisfarne Island, which is off the northeast coast of England. Um, they're uh, not always called Vikings, sometimes they're called Norsemen, which just literally means Northmen, men from the north. Um, they attack monasteries all over the English and Scottish coast, um, Yarrow, Iona Isle. They liked attacking monasteries because they had really nice things to, pil to pillage for them to steal and they wouldn't, the monks didn't fight them, they didn't have weapons, so it was kind of easy pickings. Um, they terrorized Western Europe until the 11th century, a little bit beyond. They went to Ireland, Iceland, Greenland, Newfoundland, Newfoundland being in Canada, so they made it to the New World, and Russia. They colonized where they struck. They were very organized. They were not just brutes. They had colonies in Ireland, England, France, in the Baltics, and in Russia. Um, Normandy, the north shore of France, is called Normandy because the Norsemen, Norsemen becomes the Normans who populate that area of France. Uh, we'll talk about a Norman duke who sailed across the English Channel and became the ruler of the Anglo-Saxons later. Spoiler alert, it's William the Conqueror. Okay, uh, by the 11th century, some of the Vikings have become Christian, so they've been attacking these monasteries so long that they are influenced by the monasteries and um, are converted to Christianity. Um, so they build things like this. This is an example of a Viking stave church. Uh, stave churches... Um, this one is from Norway. Uh, the, they're Christian, but we, the, it's a very different style than other churches we see at this time. What they remind me of are boats. So they kind of look like the kind of design and architecture of a boat. Um, stave means, uh, it, it refers to a wedge-shaped timber that was a support within the church. So we see this interesting um, intermingling of different belief systems with different groups of people and different cultural um, intermingling. So when we look at the monasteries in England and Ireland and Scotland, we start seeing some of that zoomorphic and abstract linear interlace patterning, which is the influence of these groups of people who were just continually kind of sacking the coast. Um, here's a detail of a stave church. So this looks a little like our decorative mastheads, right? So we have some, some uh, specific architectural elements that are definitely influenced by the Viking ships. Okay, next we'll talk about the Hiberno-Saxons.